I did not see you. That's why I did not call you. Yeah. Sir, sorry, sir. Yeah, thank you, Surinder. Thank you, Manoj. And good evening. Welcome, everybody. And uh, welcome, Vineet. Great to see you, as usual. Cheerful, bright, and you know, you have always enjoyed your talks. Uh, and we're grateful to you again to you know accept uh, the invitation for this talk. And I know whenever we call upon you, you are always ready. Uh, and I think uh, we have always learned, enjoyed, and of course I have very pleasant memories of knowing Vineet since early 1990s when we worked together. So thank you very much, and thank you Manoj and Surinder for carrying this series forward. I would hand over back to you now. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Friends, now I have great pleasure to introduce the moderators for today's session. Dr. Giridhar Seduraman, a good friend of mine and a professor of neonatology from Ch Chettinad Hospitals, Chennai, India. And Dr. Murali Raj, another good friend of mine and consultant neonatology from Cross Hospital, Kodungalur, Kerala, India. Hearty welcome, both of you. Thank you, sir. Thanks for the invitation. Now, it's my honor and privilege to introduce and welcome the legend of the day, Professor Vineet Bhandari. Dr. Vineet Bhandari, MD, DM, completed his medical school from the Armed Forces Medical College, Pune, India, followed by pediatric residencies and neonatology fellowships from the Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education Research, Chandigarh, India, and the University of Connecticut, USA. He then worked at the Albert Einstein Medical Center in Philadelphia and Yale New Haven Children's Hospital New Haven for more than 20 years before becoming the Chief Department of Neonatal Perinatal Medicine at St. Christopher's Hospital for Children, Hanuman University Hospital and Temple University Hospital, Philadelphia, and a Professor of Pediatrics and Obstetrics and Gynecology at Drexel University College of Medicine in 2015. In 2020, he joined the division, of, division head of neonatology at the Children's Regional Hospital Cooper as Vice Chair of Pediatrics for Faculty Development, Professor of Pediatrics, Obstetrics and Gynecology and Biomedical Sciences at Cooper Medical School of Rowan University, Camden, New Jersey. Professor Bhandari has edited three books, Manual of Neonatology, Bronchopulmonary Dysplasia, and Tantalizing Therapeutics in Bronchopulmonary Dysplasia, and author, authored over 335 books and chapters in, uh, and original research articles. It is amazing to know that he managed to get funded all the time by NIH since 2003 for his research projects. And he has presented his research in many national and international conferences. It shows the quality of the research that he has done. Hearty welcome, sir, to today's session. Friends, Professor Bhandari will discuss a topic of interest to all of us, the art and science of extubation success in NICU. Now I hand over to the moderators, Dr. Giridhar and Dr. Murali Raj. Uh, over to you, Giridhar. We may start with the poll. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Dr. Vinith Bandari. I think uh, to know about uh, respiratory medicine uh, in neonatology, I think there's no better person than Professor uh, Vinit Bandari because we have to hear from the horse's mouth. So without uh, much ado, let us uh, go into the poll first. Before we start uh, the, uh, uh, the session, I think uh, the delegates can take up this poll and uh, we'll see the responses in this poll. Basically, uh, this is a question which has been given by Dr. Professor Dr. Vinit Bandari. Uh, for primary respiratory support, do you use NIPPV as a primary respiratory support in units? So uh, people have the option of only uh, choosing one option. Uh, either it is sometimes, always, or never. Uh, please, uh, can you please click on the uh, uh, answers? so that we can have the responses from the delegates. Another 10 more seconds, we'll close the poll. Shall I close? Yeah. 
so i think the predominant responses are for uh, nipp we use as sometimes 57% of the respondents have uh, uh, gone with this choice whereas 33% have told that it's always in ippv and uh, at least it seems that uh, people only 10% of the delegates attending here have never used nippv as a primary respiratory support in units so i think uh, professor sir it's over to you sir you can no next question. question next question one more question one more question is sir okay i'm sorry yeah so can we close this question sir and we'll go to the next one yeah it's not closed at eh? no sir it's not closed yet. yeah so this is the second question so uh, now we want to know how many of people use nippv as a respiratory support post extubation in units again the choices are sometimes always never in others please uh, start polling Just give five more seconds, sir. Yeah, yeah. I think that's it. Let's see. again uh, sometimes seems to be the predominant choice of uh, the, the uh, delegates here 60% have told that they use nippv sometimes for post extubation 36% have told always so i think people 96% of the people are using nippv either sometimes or always the response of others are very meager uh, so th that uh, completes the poll questions and uh, uh, can we invite uh, professor uh, vinith mandari sir to share his screen and uh, start the lecture sir can you um, thank you so much um, can you see my screen now yes sir your screen is well and visible sir okay excellent um, thank you so much uh, for the invitation manoj um, surinder and uh, praveen and thank you for, to the uh, to the moderators and thank you so much for the kind introduction um so uh, i apologize for my voice i'm at the end of a cold and i have a little bit of laryngitis so i will be sipping some nice green tea trust me it is nothing else in there just just tea <laughs> <laughs> um, hopefully in the next 45 minutes or so we are going to have some uh, discussion uh, at least presentation from my side about the science and the art of extubation success in the nicu Looking at the poll results, my aim is that hopefully by the end of our, my talk and hopefully a discussion at the end of it, that there will be zero percent, at least of the delegates who are here, who, are, uh, who answered the poll, that who will say they never or never or no, don't use NIPPV at all. I want that number to go down to zero percent. And I'm hoping the one that said sometimes or always you know, we had somewhere between 60% or so for the sometimes. I want that number to go up to about 75%. Um, and for the others who, in the hopefully down the line, in a few more years, they'll become 100%. But hopefully I will be able to convince you, showing you the data, why that is, why the science behind this non-invasive support is so strong. And the data has been accumulated over, I would say, more than 25 years now to support what I'm going to try to tell you. Okay. All right, why do we want to, um, I hope you can see my second slide about the pathogenesis of new PPD. Yes, and, sir. Excellent, all right. Why do we want to focus so much on non-invasive support? Well, I think we all are, understand that BPD is a big problem for us and where it is not a problem, if as you start seeing the smaller babies, you it will become a problem. So BPD is a complex disorder. There is genetic predisposition and epigenetic modulation and and the start of BPD happens, obviously, probably you could argue given the genetic predisposition at conception, uh, but definitely there is some antenatal component to it. You have chorioamnonitis, placental problems, and other stuff that could be contributing. What I want you to understand that while we talk about BPD as a yes or no phenomenon, the propensity or the tendency to get BPD, one should always think of it like a speedometer dial. So you have the extreme and you have the resilience or the resistant, maybe genetically, or you have some increased vulnerability. 
And this resident lens of vulnerability has different gradations as denoted by the speedometer dial. Anyhow, once the baby is born, we are going to expose the baby to supplemental oxygen and the focus of today's talk, invasive positive pressure ventilation. The combination of the genetic and these two very important environmental factors, and of course there is information that's going to come into play, is also contributed by infection. Now there are modulating factors. You know, there is the breast milk feeding, microbiome, vitamin A, and all the other factors which I've not listed here, uh, but some of them are listed, caffeine and postnatal steroids that are going to modify this inflammatory response. The timing of the inflammatory response is very critical for the baby to get BPD or not get BPD, or at least uh, have the decreased or increased severity of BPD. Notwithstanding the fact that you have an inherent tendency to get BPD, but the modulation of these factors are very, very critical. And what I'm going to try to impress upon you is that if we can modulate the invasive ventilation factor, it can potentially improve or decrease the amount of tissue damage and which will hopefully try to prevent you from getting severe BPD, hopefully even prevent BPD in certain circumstances, but if not, at least try to prevent severe BPD. Um, how does invasive mechanical ventilation lead to lung injury and BPD? Uh, this is from my uh, textbook uh, in bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Um, and you can see that the variety of factors that are involved and they release and it acts on different types of lung cells in the body. I'm focusing here on the inflammatory cells, endothelial cells, epithelial cells, fibroblasts, all of this, they release a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines. And the balance between the pro and anti-inflammatory factors affects the degree and the persistence of the inflammation. The more a foreign body stays inside your body, the more likely that you will get uh, more inflammation. And I will highlight this many, many times in my talk that the timing of this inflammation and the variability in the response of the body to this inflammation is very, very critical in how we get BPD. This is just highlights the same fact that I've just mentioned. It shows you sensitivity and 100 micro specificity on the, X, uh, the X axis and sensitivity in the Y axis. As you can see, the longer you spend your time in, on invasively ventilating, the more likely you're going to get BPD. Timing is everything. And this is a nice picture I got off the internet, which just shows you how the delivery of the baby by the stroke is to the, in this case, the father's hands. And, and the photographer, hopefully he didn't Photoshop it, but I'm assuming he was able to time the, of the photograph that when the, the stroke was flying over, the baby was, had been sent up into the sky <laughs> to be dropped off, so to speak. And then of course, he's very happy to be caught by his father. So timing is a very critical factor. And I will highlight that throughout my talk. And I want to emphasize that, that the timing of when you extubate the baby becomes very, very important to try and mitigate this tissue damage that the lung will get if you, are, if you have kept the baby intubated. So we did a study many, many years ago. It's a retrospective study. We said, let us see what the baby support has been at 24 hours, day of life one to three, and day of life four to seven. And we divided it into three categories, endotracheal tube, NIPPV, and CPAP. And we said, what are the chances? How many of these babies who are getting this types of support get into BPD? So you will notice here that at 24 hours, if you are on CPAP, you have less chance of getting BPD. And day of life one to three, if you're intubated, you have about 67%. And of course, if you have day of life four to seven, ET tube in place, you have 81% chance of getting BPD. This decreases dramatically. In fact, that within day of life four to one to three, you can see, the NIPPV rate is a little bit lower, not significantly lower. And, and of course, they're about the same <clears throat> uh, than ET tube. So the point I'm trying to make is that if you can don't have the endotracheal tube in place, um, if you have CPAP or NIPPV, you can support the baby and not keep the endotracheal tube, you can make a difference. And again, it looks like the critical time frame that, that this needs to get done, at least in terms of this study, was 24 to 72 hours. Let's get into a little bit more detail about that because you could say, well, the baby, you might be able to extubate the baby. What happens if you have to reintubate the baby? Okay. So this basically is what's called a Kaplan-Meier or a survival curve. And on the y-axis is the probability of no BPD. And on the, y, on the x axis is time from first extubation. And you can see the color coding, the blue for day of life one to three, the red for four to seven, and the teal, dark teal color for day of life eight plus. You can see very clearly that the big difference between the blue and the red compared to the dark teal color. And, 
And if you are extubating in the day of life one to three, you have the highest probability of no BPD. So that is where I'm going to be focusing on that if you are, if you have to make an, it looks like at least in this study, based on this study, and I'll show you another study that we did at the follow-up, that if you are at the first 24 hours, you have this, it's okay if you need to keep the tube in, uh, if you can take it out even better, but at least make an attempt to try to get the tube off between one to three. And so I'm going to try to get into the science of why that is necessary and how do we do it successfully. Okay. What is this? what is the difference it makes having a tube in place? So this is the data for unadjusted survival of BPD, but I'm going to be focusing on the second um, um, table here, which is the adjusted survival in terms of BPD. And it has been adjusted for a variety of factors that we could find and we collected data for, and we hope that this at least makes the data more robust and the results more convincing. What you see here, if you compare day of life four to seven to day of life one to three, having an ET tube or not having an ET tube, your risk of BPD is about two times. It is not, it is statistically significant, right? Day of life eight versus day of life one to three, it is about 13 times more likely to get BPD. Day of life eight and day of life four to seven, almost seven times more likely to get BPD. So either way, even if you're not able to extubate the baby at within 24 hours, within day to life 23, what the data is suggesting is that the longer you're keeping the ET tube in place, the more likely you are, and the risk increases exponentially. You're increasing the risk from seven times to about 13 times, almost double, if you keep the tube in longer. And people in, well, in the good old days or bad old days used to find so many reasons to keep the tube in. Well, the baby get, will get tired. I may have to reintubate again. The baby will grow better when the endotracheal tube is in place versus a non-invasive support. All those three reasons are not valid. And I will show you scientific evidence to, um, to, show, to prove that for you. Okay, this is a follow-up study that we did a few years uh, after the first study. We wanted to see, okay, let's make an effort to take the tube out. What happens if they get intubated, right? So we are going to compare three groups here, day of life one to three, four to seven, and day of life more than seven, right? And you can see how many babies have extubation failure. So if we extubated the baby between day of life one to three, we had 70% extubation failure, okay? Uh, and these are small babies. I mean, I, if I remember correctly, these are babies uh, less than 12, 50 grams or less than at least 32 weeks, if I remember correctly. But the point here is that, yes, there is a high chance of failure. We have gotten better at it. Actually, our, our failure rate is no longer that high because we have been more aggressive with NIPPV. But let's just stick to the data over here and show what happens. So I'm going to compare the ones who failed. So they got it extubated, day of life one to three, the tube went back in. And I'm going to compare with the babies who did not fail extubation when we extubated between day of life four to seven. The argument here is saying that, okay, if you're going to fail extubation in day of life one to three, let's keep the tube in for a few more days and we'll extubate when we are more sure and let's just take the tube out, okay? So what happens with the risk of BPD? Well, you see that it doesn't make a difference in terms of the risk of BPD. So just the fact that you have reintubated the baby after failing extubation in the first three days of life, it is still, it is does not highly, does not significantly increase the risk of BPD. So again, trying to tell you that it is relatively safe to do that. Let's move on to the next one. What happens if you say, oh, I want to be very safe. I'm not going to extubate in the first three days. I'm going to wait till the baby is definitely in a much lower setting than I'm going to wait for more than seven days. Here, you're going to increase the risk of eight times to get BPD. Once again, I repeat, these are the babies who failed extubation in the first three days. So we have put in the tube back in and we have followed these babies up till they reach 36 weeks post-ventral age. Even at that point, it is better for these babies to get reintubated, but you have managed to at least keep them extubated for some period of time in the first three days of life. Their risk of BPD is much lower, significantly lower, eight times lower, compared to the one that you will keep intubated beyond seven days. All right, let's talk about day four to seven versus that. And once again, it is better that the babies have been, attempt has been made to extubate between day of life four to seven. And even if the reintubation has happened 80% in this case or 79% in this case, it is still better off in terms of the risk of BPD than keeping the tube in place. All right, so just to summarize that part of the data, when adjusting for multiple relevant factors, Extubation day of life one to three is associated with a significantly reduced hazard of BPD compared to day of life four to seven, right? Or beyond seven days. 
even when you, if you, for whatever reason, you're not able to extubate day of life one, uh, one to three, try to extubate the day, baby between four to seven, because even when you do that, it is significantly reduced hazard of BPD when compared to extubation beyond seven days. This is a very critical part of, of my talk. And I will say, highlight that now, and I will highlight that again in the end. Reintubation rates do not significantly decrease uh, 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 differ across study groups. Very importantly, babies who fail extubation and need to be reintubated are still at a lower risk of VPD than babies who are first extubated later in life and do not need to be reintubated. We were the first folks, as far as I can remember, that we, uh, of course, we did a retrospective, it was based on retrospective data, but we said this and emphatically said this in 2014. And after that, there have been at least two other studies with much larger sample sizes that have reiterated the same point. And again, this is from Jensen's group, which is a huge data set. I think they used uh, one of the commercially, uh, one of the, I think it was called, I forget the name, but it was many, many babies um, uh, across many centers where they have done this. And what I want to highlight is the thing that says that um, our findings suggest that reinitiation of invasive mechanical ventilation does not increase the risk of chronic disease. A practice of routinely trying ext extubation when low ventilators are reached, even if extubation success is not guaranteed, may reduce the risk of lung injury and BPD. It has also been reiterated by a study from the Children's, uh, the children's National, sorry, the Children's uh, Nationwide Children's Hospital from Ohio. And this was a study in 20, uh, 27 weekers, less than 27 weekers, and 64% had to be reintubated, very similar to the number that I have shown, uh, about 60%. Every day, first extubation attempt is delayed. It costs the hospital $4,500, which, you know, for the hospital, it may not be a bad thing because they're making money. Uh, but from my point of view, that, that is not cost effective. Older the infant at first extubation, the more likely they will have moderate to severe. So the longer you wait, uh, for even for the bigger babies, you're going to get more problem. More importantly, reintubation not associated was not associated with either mortality, moderate to severe BPD, or increased mortality, or increased moderate severity, or length of stay. So my request to you is for the folks who do not use it or use it sometimes, please make an attempt to extubate these babies in the first three days of life. Uh, the baby will thank you for it, and I, I obviously will be very grateful to you for doing so. Okay. Now that the question is that hopefully I have convinced some of you or most of you that non-invasive support is helpful. But I'm again, again focusing on the babe, on the folks who are between the 40 to 60 percent who said they don't use an IPPV. Um, well, they may be using CPAP and stuff. So what are the different types of non-invasive support we can give these to ba babies? So I like to divide them into variable airway pressure and constant pressure. So under variable airway pressure, are, the first one is nasal high frequency ventilation. And in most circumstances is nasal high frequency oscillatory ventilation. And I'm going to show you some data for about that. And the next one I would have called is SNP or NIP. Now I have put the synchronized in quotation in, in uh, parenthesis because I, in my unit or in the USA, I really don't have synchronized an IPPV and I use only non-sync. And I think that the data, and we have shown this between SNP and NIP, we are still getting very, very good results even with NIP, as long as you do it, well, the way I would like to say, I would like to advise you to do it. Um, synchronized is obviously would be better, uh, but we do not have the ventilators uh, in the US. There are ventilators available, like for example, in Italy and other parts of the world, Julia ventilators is, is uh, supposed to be able to synchronize with the flow when you are on the nasal prongs. I have a little bit of experience with it when I was in Italy. Uh, I don't have experience with it in, in the USA with that machine. Hopefully folks who have them access to the machine We'll do it, use it, and then we'll produce the data to su support it. I will talk about NAVA separately. Uh, the other next level of decreased support would be what I would say BiPAP or CIPAP if you're synchronizing it. And then of course, we are going to, I will not talk about uh, nasal pro pro pressure support ventilation because there's a very little bit of data on that. Now, if these are what I consider the highest amount of pressures that you can give to a baby, especially if you are doing non-invasive support or you know, through the nose. When you come to the constant airway pressure, you have this variety of ways of giving CPAP. It can be variable flow, bubble CPAP, ventilator CPAP, and all the different methods of giving CPAP. And I will try to give you some data on that. And after that comes high flow nasal cannula. By that, I mean more than two liters per minute flow. And then of course, uh, two liters to up to eight liters per minute. Then of course we have low flow cannula. I'm gonna to try to touch on most of these factors and show you data 
are mostly, most of them is going to be composite data, meta-analysis or Cochrane reviews to hopefully convince you why one is preferred over the other and what does the science support in terms of selecting which support should be done initially. Okay, so this is the nasal high frequency oscillatory ventilation and CPAP post extubation meta-analysis. And you will see, I will use the pretty much the same format. Hopefully all of you are familiar with this. You have, you know, one, the odds ratio, and then you're going to look at left to right. And of course, if anything touches one, you know it is not significant. And when you look at need for intubation and mechanical ventilation and PaCO2 levels, uh, this actually does not touch this number zero. So it's definitely both most to the right, uh, to the left. And so what we find that the likelihood of decreasing the need for intubation and mechanical ventilation and increased elimination of PaCO2 levels compared to CPAP, nasal high frequency oscillatory ventilation seems to work better. Um, have, there has been some data, as far as I know, only two data pieces of data I'm aware of that have done randomized control trials. And here is comparing nasal high frequency oscillation with NIPPV with CPAP. And you can see that there is some significance. Um, oscillatory ventilator CPAP, they have found significance uh, over here. And then also the same with NIPPV versus CPAP, but this has been shown even before. And of course, with for high frequency and CPAP. However, in a second study, which is a different group, you find that they did not find any difference between high frequency oscillatory and NIPPV. I think the data supports that if you are comparing nasal high frequency oscillatory ventilation versus CPAP, it probably will decrease the need for invasive mechanical ventilation and eliminate CO2. I think that there needs to be more data in terms of comparison with NIPPV. And once again, there are different ways of giving NIPPV. Um, and I will use the word, I really, I've published guidelines on this and how much pressure I will use and what higher pressures I will go to. Uh, and I would strongly suggest that you take some time to read those guidelines. I'm happy to talk to you later or even come to your unit and show you how I do it. Uh, but if you use homeopathic doses of NIPPV, you are not going to get the benefits of NIPPV. It needs to be done with the proper uh, safeguards in place, which I will mention, which is where the art of ventilation of NIPPV or at least non-invasive ventilation will come into play. All right, in terms of primary mode of nasal high frequency oscillatory ventilation, there is at least four, four pieces of uh, uh, randomized trials that have been uh, evaluated. Now they have compared it with CPAP and they can show here that the outcome in terms um, is better uh, in terms of not needing intubation when you do nasal high frequency oscillatory ventilation as a primary mode versus CPAP. To my knowledge, there is no primary mode nasal high frequency ventilation versus NIPPV studies done so far. Okay, what about NIV-NAVA? Now, NIV-NAVA, again, hopefully all of you are familiar with NIV-NAVA, um, you know, neurally adjusted ventilatory assist, which is, you know, the, um, with the mode of ventilation where you have the, uh, the, um, the sensor in the uh, OJ tube, which detects the electrical activity of the diaphragm and synchronizes it. And you can see over here, when they have compared NIV-NAVA with NIPPV, again, very small sample size, there is no difference in the outcomes that they have listed on the left side of this, of this table. What about NIV-NAVA versus CPAP and RDS? And these are randomized controlled trials that I've looked at it. And let me see, I think I've highlighted a few things here. So, sorry, let me get my reading glasses on here. Um, so you can see over here that when you compare NIV-NAVA with the control, at least in these, out, in these parameters, they have not shown any significant difference. <coughs> but in terms of the need for endotracheal intubations, also there is no difference when you compare CPAP to NIPPV. <coughs> the number of sample size of these studies are small. So I think more data needs to be gathered, whether we can say for sure that it is better or not better, or whether it is more useful. And once again, keep in mind, they are comparing it with CPAP. Uh, there is some improvement over here in terms of during of invasive ventilation when you compare the NIV-NAVA group versus control group, but here the, <laughs> the benefit is actually in the control group, which, which was CPAP if I remember correctly. <coughs> in, this, in this situation, um, it is also the similar way that uh, here, here the NIV-NAVA um, uh, had the better outcome. So again, these are conflicting results that are coming up in these randomized trials. And these are fairly recent studies. So I think more data will need to be gathered about this to be sure about what is going on. Let's talk about bubble and ventilator CPAP. This was published in Indian General Pediatrics a couple of years ago, randomized trial, demographic data. And basically they found no difference when they compared ventilator CPAP with the 
bubble CPAP in the extubation failure or the median time to extubation. Uh, another study uh, published a few years ago, again, no difference in CPAP failure, ALIC syndrome, total CPAP time, oxygen time, or duration of hospitalization. All right, now let's move to high flow, high humidity nasal candela. Again, I'm not going to go through details because <laughs> this, this article is very, very useful. And I would recommend that you look over it because they have done a great job <laughs> in summarizing the data. The bottom line is, if you look at it, there is essentially no significant difference. And in fact, where they have tried to compare it with CPAP, uh, they have actually found more failure rates with the high flow cannula. And this data I think is very useful. This, this was a randomized control trial published in 2016 in NEJM. Oh, sorry. Uh, and here you can see that when you look at the treatment fla flavor of failure in the high flow group, it is 25% versus the CPAP group, which is 13%, which is highly significant. <laughs> and this is true whether you break up the gestational age into high and low groups and treatment failure within 20, uh, 72 hours, which is my golden time frame, 24 to 72 hours to get ready to bed, was uh, much, much higher with the high flow group versus CPAP. So essentially, I would not recommend using high flow. Um, and there are other reasons for not recommending high flow, which I will summarize when I show my summary slides. It versus at least CPAP. <laughs> How does NIPPV work? Well, NIPPV works by washing out the pharyngeal dead space, reducing the inspiratory resistance, stability of the uh, in, in, improves the stability of, of the chest wall, decrease work of breathing, opens up the collapsed alveoli. And I'll show you pictures or x-rays to show that this is actually true. People think that NIPPV is just glorified CPAP. It's not glorified CPAP. Not only does it give higher pressure than constant CPAP for obvious reasons, because we are using higher pressure, but more importantly, it actually washes out CO2. And you have to be careful. It's not as good, obviously, as the oscillator in washing out CO2, but definitely much better than CPAP in washing out CO2. And so you need to make sure you monitor the CO2 levels when you have a baby on NIPPV versus, like, say, like say on CPAP. When the different ways of synchronization, I already mentioned to you, the one that I am most familiar with was using the Gracepie capsule, which was a sensor which was be placed with a belt uh, over the baby's abdomen to the right side, just with the diaphragm over the liver, and that would detect it. It is a very good method of detecting the breathing effort because the diaphragm is the main muscle of breathing for the baby. <laughs> and that would, you know, we'll transmit it to the uh, ventilator, which is the star sync with the synchronized module. Um, and that would then uh, um, synchronize with the baby's breathing. It worked beautifully. Unfortunately, the company took away the, the sensor and the machine, and I don't have access to it. And I did try to talk to them many times, but it's a different company bought another company, bought another company. Maybe they will bring it back, but I can tell you that technology works really, really well. I already mentioned about the flow synchronization. The only ventilator that I'm aware of is the Julia ventilator, which measures the flow at the nasal. Uh, the nasal interface, keep in mind that the nasal interface flow is very small, and so it's not very easy to do it, but that machine, at the end, limited experience, my own limited experience, uh, but I've been told that it works reasonably well. <coughs> the NAVA, um, of course, is a very, very good sensor uh, of detecting the electrical activity of the diaphragm, and it obviously uh, picks it up very, very nicely and synchronizes Personally, when I've used the NIV-NAVA mode uh, with the, with the um, ventilator, I have not had good success with it. Uh, of course, it synchronizes beautifully. And in fact, when I have used it in the invasive ventilation mode, I have been able to decrease the pressure than the vent settings and oxygen. But when I've used it in non-invasive ventilatory mode in the NAVA, I have not found it superior or any way better for me, at least in my hands, when I've compared it with um, NIPPV the way I use it. I have to mention that I have not used or have access to NIV-NAVA for many years now. So I do not know if they have made improvements in the algorithm and the software. And so if that is the situation, um, it may be better, but at least in my hands, uh, at least from five years ago, six, five, six years ago, uh, it, has, it has not been shown, at least in my hand, to be better or superior uh, versus an IPPV. All right. This is what I basically was trying to ask you when I did uh, requested the poll to be done. And you can see over here that I divide an IPPV into primary and secondary mode. My primary mode is that when you use it right from the birth, which is basically using a T-piece, which is, as you know, you have pip and peep and, and, and you are ventilating the baby versus CPAP. And then continuing that in the mid, in the first two hours of life, you may be intubating and using insure to give surfactant 
or you are using Lisa or Mr. however you want to give the surfactant, but then you place the baby back on NIPPV. So that's what I consider primary mode. Secondary mode is that you've kept the baby intubated for hours or days or weeks beyond two hours. And then you say, oh, the baby has low enough oxygen settings and ventilator setting, let me extubate it and I extubate to NIPPV. You will notice that I use much higher pressures than I'm primarily using it. So whatever pressure you're using with the TPs or when you're bagging, I will go four centimeters higher than that. And that is just my starting point. And I will listen to the baby. This is where the art of extubation comes. You listen to the baby, listen to the axilla, especially on the right side, uh, because that's where all the three lobes meet. Look at the expansion of the chest, make sure the saturations are good. Look at the FIO2 requirement. I always like the FIO2 requirement to be less than 40%. <laughs> and if the FIO2 requirement is more than 40%, then I am increasing the pressure, whether I increase it, increase the mean ever pressure. Now, whether I'm increasing it by using uh, higher I times or increasing PIP, PEEP, I don't like to increase beyond six, sometimes seven, but that's pretty much the maximum I will increase, right? Um, note the fact that I will start with an I time of 0.45 and I will go up at high time, I time of 0.55. I tend to use the higher I times because I want the PIP or the pressure to be given for a longer period of time to keep the lungs open. It is critical because once I start, the lungs start having microelectrosis, then it is very difficult to open them up without intubating. And I'm trying to avoid intubating as much as possible. Um, and you can see that I will usually very rarely go to eight, but yes, it, the number is mentioned. And of course I keep a flow. Now, if you are ready to extubate the baby, maybe you have intubated the baby and kept it for uh, 12 hours, whatever, one day, two days, and you have been able to reach these settings, of 16 over five and say 25 rate. And then uh, if that is the situation, then I would uh, extubate the baby to whatever pressure if you're using 16, I would go to 18 or 20. Again, it is very important to see how much leak the baby is showing. Now I tend to, li I like to use the <clears throat> nasal prongs. I prefer the Inca prongs because I like the way the Inca prongs stay on the cheeks and I'll keep some padding on the cheeks so that it's not directly resting it. Hudson can be used, but the Hudson puts pressure on the, on the columella and really pulls up the nose a little bit. And of course, you need to keep a pad or something on the forehead because that's the way the prongs are uh, this thing. If you're going to use Hudson prong for a prolonged period of time, it can lead to something called the pig nose. So that's one of the reasons I avoid it. Um, Drager prongs are good. Argyle prongs are good. I don't really have any specific uh, push for any of these prongs. I just want to make sure that the nose is protected. I tend to use duoderm over the nose, over the, must over the mustache area, and try to protect. And if I see that the breakdown, I will switch over to CPAP, uh, to prongs, uh, sorry, to mask. But keep in mind that every time you remove and put something in, you're going to lose some pressure and you will cause some microelectrosis. So whenever the switch over has to be done, it is a two person job. Somebody has to remove it, bag it, and the other person then gets ready with the equipment and puts in very quickly so that you do not collapse the lung. That, that fact is so very important. Uh, that is also the reason why I recommend that do not use CPAP as your first line of extubation. Because if you use CPAP and then say the baby is failing, then you say, oh, I'm going to put the baby on NIPPV. Now the CPAP has already led to a lung collapse and then you want the NIPPV to open up the lung. Yes, it will open up the lung, but it is not as powerful as, as the intubation and opening up the lung. So I always recommend as primary as well as secondary mode, and I'll show you again data to back up everything. I've been Cochrane review, updated reviews of that why it is better. And, and practically, I'm telling you, if you feel the lungs are so good, you're on 30% oxygen or 25% oxygen, it's okay. Put the baby on NIPPV, put it on lower settings. Let the baby, you know, make sure you're doing fine. If the baby doing great, well, continue to wean the NIPPV and get the baby to CPAP. Not a problem with that. Don't, don't rush it. <coughs> if you do it straight into CPAP, and then you want to try to open up the lungs, then it becomes a little bit of a problem. So that's why I recommend use NIPPV as your primary mode or secondary mode after extubation, and then only go into the uh, CPAP or wean down to CPAP as the case may be. This is very critical. I will also highlight here the other art of extubation. I always put an orogastric tube to vent. Now this is very, very important, but remember NIPPV, I didn't invent NIPPV. I just modified it and made it hopefully better. Um, because 1985, Jeffrey Garland published a paper. They basically said, you can use NIPPV, but the risk of gastric perforation is very high. And then people stopped using it after 1985 till my group, and then a group from San Diego pretty much worked independent of each other to show. And we both used the SNP, uh, SNP 
mode compared with CPAP and, um, and we use the same ventilator, the star sync, uh, <clears throat> the infant star with the star sync uh, module. What was important here is that when I was trying to find a better way to do it, because can you imagine when people read the garden paper, they would be very hesitant to let me allow to put NIPPV in a baby who has a risk for gastric perforation because it can you know, kill the baby. So we modified it, synchronization came. The, I put in the word S before NIP, not very original, I know, but it works. But the orogastric tube, so I put an orogastric tube, usually it's about eight to nine French, and I will take a 10 cc syringe, remove the plunger, attach it, and then place the whole setup so that the syringe part of it, the you know the proximal part of, of the syringe is kept higher than the baby. So when the air is being pushed into the lungs of the baby and into the stomach, some air is also able to escape through the uh, venting tube. This venting tube, you can feed through the venting tube, you can give milk through it every three hours. It'll go down slowly, takes about 15 to 30 minutes, no problem. Yes, some air bubbles will come every now and then. Very, very rarely, I have a baby who does not tolerate bolus feeds. Most babies actually do very well with this. Then I will pass another five French tube in the mouth. I will actually tape it outside the baby and that tube will be connected to a feeding tube, uh, connected to a feeding pump that will give continuous feeds. But this is very rare. The point I'm trying to emphasize is that it is very critical to keep a venting tube to avoid the complication of the risk of gastric perforation. I will add here, I have been doing this for more than, uh, well, I don't remember now how many years, more than 25, 30 years. And I get information from around the world about complications. If you do this, the risk of perforation is very minimal. In fact, zero. In my lifetime, so far, I'm aware of only two that happened with me after I told them how to do the technique. In one, there was a the small for gestational age baby who was on the, stick, on the NIPPV for seven days and had gastric perforation. But the baby also had other problems, had got sepsis and stuff like that. So I'm not very sure it was just a technique or something else was going on in that baby. The other baby was a classic baby, fresh baby, brightly born, unprimary modern IPPV. I was sitting in the mouth, but I remember it so clearly. It happened when I was at Yale. And then I heard that, oh, uh, this baby had deteriorated, it's got a gastric perforation going to the OR. And I ran from my office to find out what happened. And what happened was there was a new nurse who had, who had been told or at least given the information about how to handle an IPPV, but she had forgotten to put in the orogastric tube. I want to emphasize that this story so that you remember, do not do an IPPV without the orogastric venting tube. It is very, very critical. And I remember the story in my mind and I shared it with everyone. That half, I mean, of course, the, the nurse was feeling very bad. Baby did fine. Don't worry. Baby did great. Came back intubated after some time. When the surgeons were comfortable, I extubated to an IPPV and the baby did okay. But the point I'm trying to make is that you have to take this precaution. As far as I know, we have looked into the outcomes of gastric perforation as well as NEC. We have not found any association of using an IPPV with any of these two major complications. And this is from data that I've been shared, people have told me uh, across the world. So I think it is a very safe way. It is a very powerful way of non invasively supporting the baby, but you have to take the precaution so that we don't get into the complication that Garland uh, reported uh, <clears throat> in 1985. This is a picture of a baby before and after an IPPV, and you can see how hazy the lungs are on the top frame. And once I put the baby on an IPPV, I'm able to open up the lungs, and I can assure you the CO2 was much lower uh, in this baby once I did an IPPV. You can modify, you can um, change the settings of NIPPV based on blood gases, just like you do on a baby who's on invasive ventilation. And these are gives you some guidelines of how to do it. If you're dealing with hypoxemia, you can increase rate, I time, I've given you the maximum values. Hypercarbia, you can decrease I time, increase rate. Um, for hypercarbia and hypoxemia, these are the changes. For apnea, usually these babies are doing okay. Their lungs are normal. So you usually don't need many uh, very high pressures, PIP or PEEP, to handle these babies. But I would suggest that if you are on flow, nasal CPAP, do NIPPV before you intubate the baby for just for apnea. Try it. Usually if you increase the rate and keep the pressures low, these babies do fine. 
This is my first study, randomized trial that I did, comparing SNP with CPAP. I published in pediatrics way back, oh, 22 years ago. Wow, that makes me feel old. And I will show you this data, and this has been repeated in any and most of the studies that I'm aware of. Success rate in keeping the baby extubated for the first 72 hours of life, post, this is secondary, uh, secondary nip or SNP, 94% versus CPAP. You can look at any study, study on CPAP, bubble CPAP, ventilated CPAP, one of the largest studies that I'm, I know of, um, and 160 babies in each group, I think if I remember correctly. The failure rate for CPAP as post extubation is about 60% consistently. This is success rate is 90%. Even when I waited or I analyzed the data when the babies were at time of discharge, even then I had a success rate of about 88%. So this is very, very important. I also want to highlight, even though it did not reach statistical significance, barely, almost close enough, but notice that the PCO2 values are lower in nasal ventilation versus the CPAP. This is my first study I did primary mode and PPV. And you will see again, a small study, we had to um, conflict with another NIH funded study, we had to stop the study to do that study. And you will notice my primary outcome is BPD or death and you had 52% on conventional ventilation and 20% which is significant and similarly for BPD. What is very striking and important for me to highlight in this slide is this. Look at that, look at the duration of SNP. You will notice that even on the babies who were on conventional ventilation, I had SNP because I had already shown that SNP is the better way, secondary SNP, this is secondary SNP, post-extubation. So I felt ethically that I had to extubate the baby to SNP when I reached a lower setting. In this group, obviously, the SNP was started soon within the two hours of life, whether we got the fact or not, or whether, you know, within that period of time. And you will notice that obviously there were high, longer duration of SNP. Uh, and, and of course, there is no significant difference in the duration of endotracheal tube. Even then, no significant difference in the duration of endotracheal tube, no significant di difference in the SNP data. Yet, you had much lower uh, BPD, BPD death in the, in the SNP group. That is why I'm highlighting the point. Don't that you is, want to keep your business? You're not leaving important. your business on that screen? The timing of extubation of the lung is very critical. The damage to the lung and how the baby then recovers from that. And we can discuss this uh, in the question answer situation. All right. Primary mode for RDS. Now, CPAP versus NIPPV. Very lovely paper from Ramasamy's group um, published a couple of years ago. NIP was more effective in decreasing the requirement of mechanical ventilation than CPAP. That has been shown over and over and over again. What is important is that he, in this study, he compared <clears throat> the success rates, or at least the surface under the ranking curve. And you can see for NIP, it is 95, 95%. Versus 59 for BiPAP, 32 for high flow, and 13 for CPAP. So again, the, the confidence, the fact that you look for primary mode for RDS, nasal CPAP versus NIPPV, Using an IPPV is better. But uh, NIP was associated with a reduced risk for leak compared to BiPAP and CPAP. You can see the values over here and re resulted in lesser incidence of BPD or mortality when compared to CPAP. Now I'm going to share with you, thanks to Mark Olivier de Guise. This is updated uh, Cochrane review. As far as I know, it has not been published, but Mark Olivier uh, kindly consented let, to let me use his slides that he presented at the PAS 2022 conference. Hopefully the data, the paper, Cochrane will come out. So they have done an updated review of comparing CPAP versus NIPPV. And these are the studies that have gone into the comparison. They looked at respiratory failure, defined as all these factors. And once again, you're very familiar with this. On this plot, you can see number one over here, to the left fair with NIPPV, to the right fair with CPAP. And hopefully you can see that the diamond is, well, nicely to the left of this line. And so in favor of NIPPV, the relative risk of 0.63 confidence intervals is over there. And the number needed to treat was 11 with a range of 8 to 20. This is this has taken me how many years? 30 years, 25 years plus to prove to you guys, to everyone, that if you do the NIPPV properly right at the beginning and try to prevent the tube from getting there, especially in the first three days of life, 
you will decrease BPD. You may not completely prevent it, but you can hopefully at least decrease the severity of BPD. And it's so nice to see this data. Uh, again, I know it looks like the diamond is touching it, but technically it is not because it is 0.92. Um, so in favor of NIPPV, the rectal risk of 0.69, number needed to be 20. So thanks once again to Mark olivier de Guis <coughs> letting me uh, have this uh, slide set um, so I could share it uh, in my talks when I give it. Uh, the other outcomes, um, no difference in mortality, air leaks, IBH, NEC, which is very important because I told you that one of the factors, the worried thing that worried me was, oh, if I'm nasally ventilating the baby's wood, they have an increase in NEC. Um, NIPP superiority only when delivered by a ventilator of a bi-level device. And I want to emphasize this. NIPPV is not the same as BiPAP. And one of the biggest studies that was done on NIPPV in quotation marks included BiPAP among the six different, oh, and had six different ventilators also. That is the NEJM study. And that is my problem. When you mix and match um, non-invasive techniques and you don't do it the way that at least I would like to recommend it should be done, then you are not going to get the same result. NIPP, is, if, if you have synchronization, NIPP is better. Here, most studies were done around 30 plus minus two weeks or so 28 to 32 weeks, so to speak. Uh, but I can tell you that my data, at least in the one that I've uh, shown, is always in younger. But depends upon what NICU population you're taking care of. And so here, um, I would recommend if this is a population you're taking care of now, 28 to 30 weeks and above, definitely do try NIPPV and you'll be very happy with the results uh, when you see it. And once again, get into problem, call me, email me, I'm on WhatsApp uh, or invite me over if I'll actually show it on a baby how I do it. And I've done that in many NICUs around the world and happy to do that for you guys too. What about CPAP versus NIPPV versus with combination of Mr. Lisa? I think this is very exciting. Um, in my unit, I, I have, we have actually published a paper. We were part of the um, MIST study of Peter Dargavel. And so, but we don't have the catheters now. We were trying to do the LISA study, but then that study got canned because the catheter was not functional. Uh, there were some issues with the quality control. But this is a very nice study, which was published in um, 2016 from Turkey. And where you can see that they have used MIST versus compared to the others. Uh, doing CPAP versus NIPPV. All the other studies have shown NIPPV better than CPAP, but they show even a better response. Now, I will say that if you're doing insure, and we do insure in our unit right now, but we do proper insure, which means intubate, surfactant, extubate immediately. We are not allowing the ventilator to be connected. I do not allow the tubes to be fixed, unless, of course, you know, it's some much smaller baby, you're talking 23, 24 weeks, and something else is going on. But for the bigger babies above 20, 25, 26 weeks, if he needs a factor, we will do the insure, keep the baby on NIPPV. The baby may get reintubated, but that's okay. But we'll definitely try to keep the baby on NIPPV. If you have the tendency to keep baby connected to the ventilator, even for oh, one hour, two hours, oh, let's let the let's get the lines in, let's get the baby settled in. Oh, then I would recommend you consider Mist and Lisa because that will prevent you from connecting the baby to the ventilator. Uh, high flow nasal cannula versus CPAP um, from here. Once again, showing you no difference and for respiratory failure and reintubation, but I've already gone over this fact. And I personally, I'm not very fond of high flow cannula because you actually are not able to measure the pressure. With CPAP, at least you know what pressure you're given. And with high flow, you can get, you can be delivering anywhere from what, five, four, five, six liters per minute. And the pressures may be generated depending upon the interface, what the baby is doing, four to 17 uh, centimeters of water pressure. That has been shown. Um, so I would be wary of using high flow cannula as a general, general basis. Uh, when you compare NIPP with BiPAP in terms of respiratory failure, hopefully you can see the diamond to the left and compared to reintubation, once again, diamond to the left compared to CPAP or BiPAP, once again, showing you the security. This is another analysis published in JAMA Pediatrics. All right, I am going to be finishing my talk in the next four or five minutes, so have some time for questions. Attempt to extubate in the first 72 hours of life. I cannot emphasize this enough. The earlier, the better. Don't be scared. Babies amazing are amazing. And especially if you can give the surfactant early, especially in the first two hours of life, however you want to do it, and keep the baby on NIPPV, you will get a good result. Attempt to focus on 24 to 72 hours. That's the window of opportunity uh, to extubate. Do not get scared. If 60 to 70, 50 to 70 percent of babies will get reintubated, various reasons. They get tired. Actually, the three categories of, of patients who get reintubated. And I will talk about that. As, maybe I can talk about that in a question and answer. What are the babies that fail NIP? Uh, because I want to give an opportunity for the question answer to come up. 
reintubation at later postnatal ages does not worsen outcomes. I have to emphasize this. Don't be scared to extubate a baby uh, because, oh, the baby will get reintubated, the baby will get tired. We have shown, by the way, that the babies feed very well. As long as they give the same calories, they will grow. In fact, we have shown data that they actually feed better. They get to full volume of feeds better when you're an IPV. The reason we believe that happens is because when you're doing non-invasive support, the degree of inflammation and damage to the lungs is less. The cytokines have to calm down a little bit, and that makes the baby feel better. The tolerate feeds better. You increase the food better. So I think that is part of the reason. But it will do not keep a baby intubated because you say that they will grow better. They don't. Um, also, it's important, unless you know, you're know you in a unit where you don't have a person who knows how to reintubate. That's a separate issue. But otherwise, if you have people who can reintubate a baby, do not hesitate, do not be scared to extubate and use NIPPV. For nasal high frequency, the most studies have used high frequency oscillatory ventilation. Post extubation, uh, NHFOV is better than CPAP, probably equivalent to NIPPV, but we need more de data on that. Uh, primary support, it's better than CPAP. Not bad. And uh, for NIPPV, again, seems to be no difference. Now, it does not matter what ventilator you use to give CPAP. I will say this. If in your unit, cost is not an issue, use variable flow systems or whatever ventilator CPAP you have. If cost is an issue, use cheap and simple bubble CPAP systems. Um, they're great. You know, make sure you take the proper precautions in terms of, you know, uh, infection, the water and all is all kept clean. The setup is all this thing. It works great. I don't think they are superior to ventilator CPAP. But if you have a limited number of ventilators in your unit and you want to save it for giving NIPPV, which I would highly recommend, then I would strongly suggest you use bubble CPAP as your uh, method to giving CPAP. CPAP pressures, I tend to avoid more than eight centimeters. I know there are units in Australia, for example, maybe some in unit uh, in Europe, maybe that we're using high. But personally, I am concerned. Yeah, I know about the, you, I'm sure you're aware of the COIN trial. I'm sure you're aware of the increased incidence of pneumothorax. And I know the explanation said it's probably not because of the high pressures, but I find it, especially for the bigger babies, that, that if I use higher pressures, I am I have seen enough uh, air leaks that I tend to avoid it. Highly recommend use short binasal CPAP prongs. Do not use long prongs. Mask you can use, but make sure the fitting is appropriate. When you use longer prongs, the resistance in the circuit is directly proportional to the length of the tube and indirectly proportional to the fourth power of the radius. I'm sure you know this physics, right? But if you use the nasal pharyngeal prong, if you look at the caliber, it actually starts off like this and then it narrows down. So you can imagine the length is contributing to resistance plus the fact that it decreasing the caliber of the, of the diameter of the nasal pharyngeal prong that will increase the resistance. So at least from our hand, and we have tested it, we have published it, uh, it does not, it is not better. In fact, it is more, we found it more problematic, causes more secretion than suction and more blockade. And we have to remove the tube, remove the prong, put another prong. And once again, every time you remove the pressure, baby loses pressure, you get into trouble. In fact, that is one of the main reasons we will all recommend that when you're using Lisa mist, you have the prongs in place so that once you, the tube or whatever you're using catheter to give the surfactants taken out, you do not lose the pressure. It becomes very, very important. It is difficult to open up the lungs once they start becoming microactatic. Nasal BiPAP, I personally will tell you the data suggests it may probably not as effective as CPAP, maybe, maybe, maybe may not be, but definitely NIPPV is stronger and not the same as BiPAP or even CPAP if you synchronize it. High flow is two to eight liters per minute. I think there is a variability in the amount of end excretory pressure that you measure. And I think at this point, I would recommend not to use it definitely for primary support as the NEGM paper showed. And I tend not to use it just because I'm not able to measure the pressure. I will keep a baby on an IPPV and I will move the baby to CPAP and then I try to get to low flow. Uh, I mean, two liters and then go down. Primary mode SNP recommended as first choice for RDS based on the data that I showed you. Secondary mode recommended as first choice for extubation. Recommendation to control apnea escalating from nasal C cannula to CPAP to NIPPV to avoid intubation. Now, I think the combination of SNP -NIP with Lisa Mist is great. I think more studies need to be done, but the data, whatever we have so, seen so far is very exciting. One more, I've mentioned few arts of uh, the art of extubation in between my talk. One more thing I want to mention that loss of pressure is probably one of the most challenging things when you're giving an IPPV. And so closing the mouth of the baby requires little expertise. When I'm doing an IPPV, the first time I'm putting the baby, I've told you how I assess the pressure and how the lung expand and auscultation. I will also do a chin lift, close the mouth and see what pressure the machine is showing me. I do not like it. If I want to give the baby 24 and the machine is showing me, uh, you know, 20, 22, 
22, 24, I'm fine with it. It's showing me 17, 18, 20, not good. That means I have to find other ways to make sure that the mouth is closed. Uh, I use a pacifier. I can dip it in some sucrose. They like to suck on it. I've used a chin strap. You tell the nurse, they are very, very innovative. I had one nurse, I said, find a way to close the mouth, but don't sew the mouth, you know, like don't sew it shut. Don't use like needle and thread. <laughs> and she came up with this unique, she took the uh, phototherapy, the Velcro goggles, and she connected two, one on each other with the Velcro and then made a chin strap. It was brilliant. And it stuck to the head, uh, the cap of the baby. And the baby was very comfortable. Um, again, do not forget, please do not forget, do not forget to put the vented venting tube, the venting OG tube when you do NIPPV. With that, I think my message, this one, it says picture is worth 1,000 words. This slide is worth 1,003 words. That's all folks, happy to take questions. If you am not able to answer the questions, you can check out some of my books and chapters in them. With that, I will stop and hand it over back to the moderator. Thank you so much for your attention. Hopefully it has been useful for at least some of you, if not all of you. Thanks once again. Thank you, Professor Vinit uh, Bandari sir for that wonderful lecture. Uh, I think you have, been, uh, you have been able to drive home the uh, messages pretty clearly. And uh, so we have all, so that the fence sitters, when it comes to usage of NIPPV, I think people would have got convinced by that by this time. Uh, <laughs> so, so I think uh, uh, we'll take up some questions. There are uh, many questions in the uh, um, Q and A box. Uh, um, so the first question is, uh, uh, I mean. Uh, uh, Dr. Ankit Gupta wants to know about the comparison with nasal, uh, the Triple H FNC. I think you have already told us about that. Can you please reemphasize, sir? Uh. Yeah, so I've already answered that question, uh, <clears throat> uh, Ankit. Uh, is the fact that I think if you're using it as primary mode, the answer is no. Do not use nasal high frequency. The failure rate is much higher than using CPAP and definitely much higher and NIPPV that I've already mentioned. I personally do not like to use it even as secondary mode because I worry about the amount of pressure that's being given to the baby depending upon the interface that's been used. So I would recommend do not use it. Um, and um, till I know there is technology that hopefully will come down the line where they may be able to measure the pressure. And if I can control the pressure that I'm giving, um, you know, and I'm and the constant pressure, maybe yes. But at the moment, my recommendation is not, I do not like to use uh, uh, nasal high flow. In my unit, I know there are other attendings who like to use it, but I, at least we have been, I've been able to convince them not to go beyond uh, three to four liters per minute with vaporetherm in certain circumstances, but yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I'll take up further questions related to the um, comparison of uh, NIPPV with uh, the other uh, ways of giving uh, uh, nasal uh, non-invasive ventilation. So, uh, uh, Dr. Sakir, uh, wants to know, uh, when do we actually use nasal high-frequency oscillatory ventilation in your unit, sir, and your protocol? Yeah, so I actually do not use, I don't have personal experience of using nasal high-frequency oscillatory ventilation in my unit. Like I said, based on the data, it seems to be equivalent to my NIPPV, and obviously I'm very <laughs> comfortable using NIPPV. Uh, but from whatever I have seen, uh, based on the data, they have people have published, you know, done a couple of randomized trials. People have used it soon after extubation, like secondary mode, right at the beginning, or primary mode. Uh, people have used that. From my understanding is that I think if you have an issue with CO2 accumulation, you might like to use that in the right from the get go. But I have no personal experience of using an NH of OV in my unit. Uh, but just like I said, I'm very comfortable and I can crank up. Uh, the NIPPV settings to get rid of CO2. I've not had a problem with that. So um, there is a question from uh, Dr. Rajiv. Uh, is there any uh, gestational age uh, based subgroup analysis uh, uh, comparing NIPPV versus CPAP? Uh, does it, uh, NICPV, is it superior at, across all gestational ages or uh, I mean, is there a variation based upon the gestational subgrouping, sir? Yeah, so the number of studies that have for the smaller gestational age babies between less than 28 weeks is obviously lesser than the higher. But I can tell you, at least in my experience, if the baby can breathe on their own and can handle, you know, and I, I, I can assess that right from the beginning, uh, from birth, I will extubate the baby. The ones that I'm a little bit hesitant is when I'm dealing with 22, 23, 24 weeks, maybe. 
the ones that are really, really small, and I'm very hesitant unless I can get them down a little bit. I have I use what I call the 40, 60, 80 percent rule as far as the FIO2 is concerned. If I find the baby is requiring more than, if it's starting to inch up from 40 percent to 60 percent, I start getting worried. And then I'm cranking up the settings because I really, really want the FIO2 to be down. If I have a baby on high enough setting and I'm on 60, 70 percent oxygen, I can tell you my risk of free intubation is like 80 percent, and I'm prepared for that. But I will give it a shot. I will crank it up as much as. If you want to know what is the smallest baby that I have kept safely extubated for at least a number of days, um, is actually 468 grams. Obviously, it was a small for gestational age baby, X26 weaker. Um, but I think if you're dealing with, you know, appropriately gestational age babies with immature lung, mom didn't get steroid, those babies are a little bit more challenging, even when you've given early surfactant. Um, I try to extubate babies, anyone who is 24 weeks and above, and even some 23 weeks and above, if I see that they have a good drive, and especially if the mom has received annual steroid 48 hours and things like that. Um, but yeah, anything less than 28 and anything more than 23, I will give it a shot. Yeah, that answers the question. And uh, Dr. Ashok wants to know about uh, experience with using a RAM scannula for delivering in IPPB. Yeah, so, yeah. I think so you know, Ramanandan is also with us. He can also share his own experiences, sir. Yes, of course. You can answer I think Dr. Ram is also on somewhere here. Um, you know, I tend, and again, Ram Kandla has always been very comfortable for babies, and do I do get push, push, push in for that? Um, I tend to use it. I tend to use it if you know if the baby is on slightly lower settings. Um, I know Dr. Ram has used it with higher settings. The, you know, the design of the Ram Kandla does involve that you have to keep a little bit less uh, snug because otherwise the CO two will accumulate. But I think. If, the, if, if there is nasal, uh, you know, little bit of damage to the nose, um, I will either try to switch to mask. And if that still doesn't work, I might try it, but I usually tend to wait if I am if I can get the FIO2 down. So whatever settings I'm using, if I, the FIO2 is down to about less than 40%, and if that is happening, then I will use it. But otherwise, I, I don't use, do routinely use that. Uh, thank you, sir. I think Professor Ram is no longer with us. I think uh, he has uh, probably logged out. So, I mean, from Dr. Saki regarding what is the nature of uh, nasal prongs you use in a unit, sir? I think you were mentioning the Inca prongs. Yeah, were, so I, uh, I, I'm very fond of the Inca oh, prongs that, you know, they tend to extend like this and you can rest them on the cheekbones because I like the pressure on the nose being distributed equally. I do put in some uh, soft, um, you know, uh, soft cloth or soft, uh, like a pot, I don't, whatever the material that you have, that, that will prevent the, the prongs to be uh, sitting directly on the skin, like you know some kind of uh, <clears throat> spongy material, right? Um, that I think helps. Uh, I tend to like that. The Rager prongs, the Argyle prong also have similar design. The one that with the Hudson, you know, you have to keep it on the forehead. And again, you will keep that sponge or like a small square of spongy thing so that it doesn't really hit. But it does really pull the nose a little bit more. I mean, it does definitely give it a snug effect. Um, I think, again, whatever you have, uh, you can use. Just be careful about, and I also protect the nose. Very, very important. I take duoderm or some, some barrier, and I will put it across the nose. And I will take it separate out. I'll make the shape, take and do this away from the baby. Please take a scissor, make two holes. Uh, just by the scissor and then put the prongs in there through the holes so that then it's very nicely snug. And I will also keep a duodenum as a mustache. So the prongs are not resting directly on the on the skin of the nose or on the um, on the upper lip. It's very important. I think it protects them. Uh, people have, again, the mask is supposed to be less this thing. Sometimes the, the baby, you, know, you see what the baby likes, but I my go-to is the prongs before I try the mask. Uh, there is a question from Dr. Sudhir Penugonda regarding uh, the usage of NIPPV. I mean, he wants to know which is the best mode for uh, meconium aspirations we want to use non-invasive ventilation. Yeah. So again, I think meconium aspiration, obviously, as you're aware, happens mostly in term babies. These babies are very active and alert. Um, so I think I tend to, you know, start off with CPAP in these babies because I actually do not like to use non-invasive stuff on them because they tend to fight a lot and the, the risk of air leak does increase. So if I find I'm using higher CPAP, like six or seven, I will actually intubate the baby. 
Uh, I just have had bad experience with doing uh, N CPAP and NIPPV. I tend to actually avoid N NIPPV in the baby with meconium aspiration syndrome, especially if you're talking about full-term babies who tend to fight a lot. Uh, or at least they don't, you know, they, they don't, just don't like the prongs uh, because the risk of air leaks becomes higher. Thank you, sir. Um, there was a question regarding uh, air leaks in the NIPPV. Is uh, air leaks, especially PIE, more with... Uh, 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 the non-synchronized NIPPV versus a synchronized NIPPV, sir. Your thoughts on that? No, no, no data to suggest that there is any. I have published a paper where it compared, it I compared when I had the SNP versus SNP. I looked at all the outcomes, including air leaks and stuff. No difference, as far as I know. Uh, using SYNC versus SNP has not been shown to make a difference in the degree of air leak, long as you use it properly. Very important. Thank you, sir. And uh, it, from this is a question from Dr. Tripti Agrawal. Uh, she wants to know what are the main reasons for extubation failure in a unit? Third? Are these respiratory or is there other uh, reasons for extubation yeah. failure? So I have a, a paper published on, on the NIP failure. If you put in NIP failure in my name, you will get the paper. Essentially, to summarize, there are three major categories. The first category is the babies who will fail within a few hours. They will fail within six hours. And you will see within an hour or two, I will have a baby, and by the way, I told you how I set it up, and I do it, and I usually leave the baby alone for an hour after making sure that the pressures are properly generated, the mouth is closed, the venting tube is there, and I've listened properly, and an hour I will check the blood gas, and if the blood gas is fine, I will leave it alone, but remember, I always worry about the FiO2, so if I see the FiO2 creeping up, I'm cranking up the setting. Despite all that, I find that the, some babies are going to fail within two to six hours, those babies will fail in the sense that they will, you will find them having either more desaturation, apneic episodes, and you're cranking it up, cranking up, and you've gone beyond 60, 70%, and you just, I just reintubate those babies. Those babies have too weak muscles. The muscles are too weak, and they are just not able to handle a non-invasive support. And in these, I will intubate, and I will wait for about five to seven days, focus on nutrition, try to minimize the invasive ventilator settings, and try to, try, to, try to get them to gain at least 100 grams before I try to re-extubate them. The other second category of patients are the ones I really make a lot of effort on. Now, these babies get re-intubated after two, three, four days of being on NIPVV. And these, some of them, about 50 to 60% of them, I believe, can be prevented. What happens is they have this FiO2 creep. What is happening is that these babies, you know, they have, the nursing staff, is very, very critical. They're doing their best, making sure the prongs are there. Sometimes they have to change, you know, bagging, whatever, suction, whatever. So things happen is that the lungs start to have a little bit of microelectasis. The NIPP is powerful enough. It'll try to open up as much as it can, but this microelectasis starts accumulating to macroatelectasis. When microatelectasis becomes macroatelectasis, which you can actually probably see on the X-ray if you do one, um, that's when these babies really, really start having desaturations. So I try to prevent it, and I'm again watching the FiO2. I like to keep it less than 40%. If I see the FiO2 is creeping 45, 50%, if the baby may look good, the gas may be good, I'm still cranking up the pressures because the baby is compensating as the best you can. But if you don't try to preemptively anticipatory, anticipate that this baby is going to become from micro, become macro atelectasis, you're going to get into trouble. I'm able to succeed in about 40, 50% of these babies by actively telling them, no, if the FI2 increases, come and tell me, I will increase the settings for that. The third category of babies that fail are the ones who get infected. And these ones, you really cannot do much. I mean, they will just suddenly collapse with a complete cardiovascular collapse, the blood pressure falls, you just intubate, take care of the you know, infection, antibiotics, seven days, then try to extubate. But again, I, I have many more details about these categories and stuff like that uh, in, the, uh, in the paper, in the publication. If for any, by the way, all of the stuff that I've shown you, except for some of the data where I was thankful for uh, another speaker to give me the slides, um, share the slide, our published data, any article you cannot get, email me, I'm easily accessible on the internet, Put in, send me an email and I will send you the PDF of that paper. Thank you, sir. And uh, there's a question on, uh, I mean, uh, if there are recurrent uh, ex mean, uh, extubation failures and baby requires a re-re-intubation, I mean, second intubation, is there a, a increased chance that this baby will have a higher mortality or IVH? No, absolutely no. Again, I will always emphasize, if you use the NIPPV technique the way I have described it, you have maximized the way NIPP is being done, it is 
not going to increase your risk of PPD. Regarding IVH, I have not read any study where there's been association of increased IVH in NIPPV compared to any of the other modes of ventilation that we have talked about. So I would not worry. As you know, NIPP risk is maximum in the first three days of life, and I am pushing for you to use NIPPV earlier in those the same time frame. And to the and we have done many studies. Other people, Brazil, China, India, people have done studies. We have not seen an increase with uh, IVH or any association with increased IVH. Yeah. So, the, so the, for some more questions, sir, can I uh, call upon my co-panelist, uh, Dr. Murli Raj, uh, to actually take over, sir? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Sridhar. Thank, thank you, Mr. And uh, thank uh, Professor Vinay uh, Pandari for this excellent presentation, which is a perfect blend of evidence with a lot of practical points and also your personal experience. Uh, sir, uh, there are some questions in the uh, question answer section because majority of we uh, prolong this intubation with the fear of ext uh, this ext extubation failure. So, uh, Dr. Sandeep Telwani want to know. Uh, he usually uh, accounts, uh, encounters a lot of this uh, laryngeal edema following this extubation. So what are the ways to prevent it and manage in the post-extubation period? I'm sorry, ask that question again. Yeah, they're, they're, but it's about the post-extubation laryngeal edema. Edema. Um, actually, yes. I haven't seen that because I, as I mentioned to you, I'm very aggressive in doing it early enough. But yes, if you do have laryngeal edema, I will try a racemic epinephrine, and and uh, if I know if I see I have, uh, this baby at a higher risk, and I'm trying to extubate the second time, I will give the three doses of dexamethasone, you know, one or two doses before and one or two doses after uh, extubation to try and uh, di uh, diminish that and prevent. It. I have actually in one case I have to tell you the story. I had a baby that had uh, laryngeal edema and was uh, getting ready to get reintubated. We have tried racemic epinephrine, had steroids on. I put the baby on uh, Heliox. Uh, as, as long as your re requirement for oxygen is less than 70%, you can actually put in Heliox with your oxygen tubing. Talk to your respiratory therapist. I mean, I'll use the Hindi word. I mean, I use Jogar all the time when I'm in the USA, but <laughs> in India, I think they do it much better than what I do it. But I had a good respiratory therapist and I was able to get an, a Heliox attached to the system of NIPPV, which is the regular ventilator and I was able to prevent the baby from getting intubated. So, racemic epinephrine, steroids, yes, and heliox, especially if the FIO2 is less than 70%, try it, avoid the tube if you can, it works. Okay, okay, thank you, sir. <clears throat> and a lot of people have asked about the feeding during the time of NAPPV. So, yeah. you, during this, you, you, you already told that you, you have to put a venting tube. So, you, are, you, you would like to put an additional feeding tube to that stomach? And also, no, no, if no, 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 the baby in no, no. so, how many yeah, times? So, yeah, so the venting tube is used as a feeding tube. So, physiologically speaking, bolus feeds are much better than continuous feeds. It has been shown beautifully by Alan Lucas way back in 1978, I think, published in Lancet. Um, so, we know that it has better for the enzymes and the growth of the villi and stuff like that. So, I will feed the baby through the, vent through the venting tube. You know, you have the OG tube, you have the syringe and it's kept about, right? Only the proximal part of the syringe, the plunger is thrown out. You drop in one cc, three cc, whatever it is, it will drip down. And you do that every three hours. Like I told you, most babies, they feel better because their lung inflammation, I believe, is better. And there is data to back that up, animal data also to back that up. Um, we will feed through that. You can go to 3 ml, 10 ml, even 10 ml. If you have to give 20 ml, which is rare, you know, bigger baby, you can do it in two different alicots. So I feed through the venting tube, which is also my feeding tube. In the rare situation where the baby is having distension, despite this, or the feed is going back and forth, back and forth, and not finishing over the period of 20 minutes, 30 minutes, one hour, whatever, then I will put in a five French tube. And I will put along with the, so venting tube is there, five French tube is there, and I will actually tape it. We go to remind the nurse that both these tubes are very important. Don't remove one or the other. Keep them together. And the five French tube is connected to a feeding pump. And then you can feed the baby continuously through that. But this is rare. I will highly recommend oh, the venting tube to be used as a feeding tube. Try it. If it doesn't work, then you can go to this five, uh, five gauge, five French feeding, uh, uh, feeding tube connected to a pump for continuous feeding. 
Okay, sir. Uh, a lot of people have asked about uh, other treatment modalities like oral vitamin A in prevention of BPD. Yeah. Also, caffeine. Also, yeah, sir, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Ambal one and other folks have done the studies on this thing. If you want to give vitamin A, it has to be given I am three times a week to so four weeks to, you know, and you have to treat about uh, 14 to 15 babies to save one baby's BPD. So there is no other way. People have tried different things, less dose, high dose, oral, whatever. Uh, as of now, the only way vitamin A works is through that. Okay, sir. Uh, Dr. Manish has asked about the use of NAPPV in neonates with the features of shock or hemodynamic instability. So the task. Not recommended. Do not use it. They're, they're, if you are in shock or in uh, hypotension, these babies do not tolerate an IPPV. You will have to intubate the baby, get them out of shock, give them a couple of days of uh, fluids, resuscitation, antibiotics, whatever you need. Uh, shock babies on cardiovascular collapse will not do well on an IPPV. Do not try it. It doesn't work. They'll, they'll fail very, very quickly. Okay, sir. Another question is about the concept of rest in NIV. That maybe you know, meant about this uh, pacific, pacific or uh, sedation you used in sedation. babies. I do not sedate babies on NIPPV. In fact, in my unit, babies born, you know, stabilized, stabilized, and all that kind of stuff. You give, we get vitamin K at birth in the DR. I prophylaxis. Once they come to the unit, they get ampicillin, gentamicin, and the fifth drug they get is caffeine. I'm very fond of caffeine. I use caffeine for a long period of time. Again, read up some of the articles that we published on caffeine and how to use it. It's also in the textbook. There's a full chapter on caffeine. On, and we use much higher doses. Nowadays, recommendation is that as a baby grows, you can use higher doses. So caffeine, yes. Sedation, no. If I get a baby who's agitated, which is not very often. Again, remember that pacifier with the sucrease, it seems to calm the baby down. And majority of the babies, even though it's not synchronized, the baby figures out the NIPP is actually helping me breathe. They will, to some extent, synchronize with the, with the machine and they will feel comfortable. I do not sedate because then that will affect the, uh, the respiratory drive or depress the respiratory drive. Okay. Dr. Mayank Priyadrashi has asked about the uh, incidence of PAE, the NIPPV. Now he wants to know how do we decrease this pulmonary insufficient emphysema with the NIPPV? Yeah. That's a I don't, I'm not aware of any studies where they have had babies with NI, um, PIE and they have used NIPPV to see if it, if it makes a difference or not. I can tell you that NIPPV per se does not increase the risk of any type of air leak, pneumothorax or PIE or pneumopericardium or anything else when you compare it with other forms of non-invasive support. Okay. But I do not know of any study that has looked at the treatment of PIE by using NIPPV versus invasive stuff or or like, like say with the oscillator or something like that. I am not aware of any studies. Okay. Another question is about the use of NAPPV in suspected NEC or uh, babies who have recurrent yeah. apnea. Or, uh, so, most, or, so, so you know the factors. Yeah. So I mentioned to you already that NIPPV per se does not increase the risk of NEC. That has been shown. Many studies have shown that. If a baby has NEC, would I routinely intubate the baby and avoid giving an IPPV? So I'll answer the question this way. If the baby has definite NEC with the pneumatosis and stuff like that, it, probably yes. Because if the baby is not doing well, the blood pressure is a little bit fluctuant and the FI2 is climbing up, I will tend to intubate. If the baby is in the suspect NEC mode, then I will uh, keep the baby on, on an IPPV. Sometimes I have, since the baby is going to be NPO anyway, I have changed the venting tube with a repogal to keep it suctioned out. Um, so I think I let the baby decide. With suspect, maybe yes. With definite, probably no. So another question is uh, data from your unit, sir. What is the common cause of the extubation failure in your unit? So should we take extubation failure as 72 hours or extend up to seven days? That's the question so from extubation failure using NIPPV? Yeah. No, sir. Common causes the extubation failure in your unit. In my unit, post extubation, not primary mode, secondary mode you're talking about, right? Yes. I haven't analyzed the data from the unit I'm working right now, but we are analyzing the unit in the other places that I've worked. I showed you the data, depending upon the timing of extubation that I'm using. So if I try to extubate within one to three days, 
um, and the, the data that I showed you from the first uh, couple of slides on my presentation, that data is during the entire stay in the NICU. So if I extubated a baby and day of life one, two, three, and the baby got reintubated, that reintubation is during the entire stay in the NI, NI in the unit. So obviously, um, depending upon the different categories of stuff, I, I cannot categorize them in less than 32 hours and this thing, except for the individual studies. But overall, it is for the smaller babies, less than 28 weeks, it's probably in the range of about 60 to 70%. Okay. Dr. Rajiv Mahalwatra wants to know whether this, sir, I already told that there is no problem in repeated intubation. I'm sorry, Oscar, what is, you know, what is the question again? Doesn't that recurrent intubation increase the chance of ventricular hemorrhage? What Rajiv Malhotra wanted. Uh, I see. On recurrent intubation increases the chances of IVH. IVH. IVH, there, there's no, no incident, no, no uh, association with IVH. So if you have to reintubate a baby who failed an IPPV, does it increase the risk of IVH? The answer is no. No difference. Does not impact risk of IVH becomes much less after three days. And remember, we are giving vitamin, we have an IVH prophylaxis um, team or prophylactic bundle over here, which I'm sure may, other places may be having it too. But we give vitamin A at birth, you know, we do other, we try not to move the baby too much and do all the other normal stuff that we try to do to prevent IVH from happening. I mean, it still happens. But as far as I know, we I'm not aware of any study where it says, just because you need to reintubate a baby three days later or five days later, you are increasing the risk of IVH. Yes. Dr. Ankit want to know the criteria for stepping up to a high frequency ventilation when this conventional ventilation doesn't seem to eat risks. So, so if, I'm sorry, where, where's the... So when you step up to HFOV from a conventional ventilation, so what are any criteria or consensus is there? About using HFOV versus conventional ventilation? Yeah. Okay, all right. So I, in my unit, so I know there are certain units in the US that use a, um, high frequency oscillatory ventilation as a primary mode or even jet ventilation as primary mode. These are mostly for the really, really small babies. You're talking about 22, 23, 24 weeks. Um, and like University of Iowa, for example, uses that. I, in my unit and where I've worked so far in other places, we have always used uh, HFOV or HF, we have all, we have both of them, a jet as well as the oscillator. We will use it only as rescue mode. Our indications are that if the baby exceeds a certain amount of mean air pressure, or if the baby, you know, the CO2 needs to be eliminated, then we will go for um, the oscillator. Remember, between the oscillator and the jet, the oscillator is much better at doing the uh, CO2 elimination. Um, one of our uh, group in my faculty is very fond of the jet, so she always puts the baby on the jet if she needs it. I am very fond of the oscillator, so I always tend to go to the oscillator because I actually had introduced the oscillator at University of Connecticut NICU when I was there and also at Albert Einstein. So I'm very familiar with it and comfortable with it. But I, I think if I want to focus on the CO2, I tend to go to the oscillator. If the baby, you know, if I put the baby in the oscillator, baby doesn't do well, I will switch the baby to the jet, you know, try to get a better uh, oxygenation because the jet works a little bit differently than that way. So the indications are if they exceed a certain mean air pressure, it's usually more than 14 in a bigger baby, more than 1000 grams or more than 12 in a smaller baby, less than 1,000 grams. If the baby has PIE or pneumothorax, also we will switch the baby to high frequency oscillation from conventional ventilation. So another doubt is uh, the outcome with the different types of interfaces. Dr. Sunil Argarwal wants to know. Yeah, what is the... so I already mentioned to you, in, in terms of interfaces, use prongs, use the short binasal prongs, the, second, the next choice, in, and I gave you the names of some of the prongs, I don't have any specific uh, interest, whatever makes it snug. It is important that it should fit in well and it should not be completely touching the skin directly. So you try to prevent the damage to the, gen, you know, to the skin of these babies, whether it's on the cheekbones or on the nose area. So those, those are criteria that I tend to use, but it needs to fit in nicely so that um, uh, it needs to fit in nicely so that the pressure that you're giving is generated, is going into the lungs as best as possible. And I already mentioned to you what we try to do to clo close the mouth. Do not use long nasopharyngeal prongs, please. Do not use that. It, it creates more problems and does not work very well. Yeah. Also, there is any pressure difference in the pressure delivery between this synchronized and non-synchronized post pressure ventilation? In terms of the pressure delivery, um, I don't know if people have looked into that. 
I know the studies that have looked into synchronized versus non-synchronized. They have looked at the work of breathing and stuff like that. What I will do mention that, you know, if you, if you close the mouth properly, if you make your best effort to close the mouth and make sure you know, chin lift, chin strap, whatever, all the different techniques I told you, that's where the art of extubation comes. The nursing is very, very, very critical for this kind of success. If you do that, the pressure loss will be within the two to four centimeters. And if you need to give higher pressure, just crank it up. You know, if the baby needs 22 and you're not getting it when your pressure is 24, go to 28 and see, make sure you get the baby to get, uh, the baby is at least seeing 22 at that point. That's the way I would do it. It's already nine o'clock. Shall we continue? Uh, it's up to you if you have, I mean, I'm okay. Let me see. Uh, okay. Okay. It's up, so, to, up to you guys. If you have more questions or they can email so, me. Manoj? Yes. 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 I think we will uh, we'll continue for one more five more minutes. Is it okay with uh, Professor Bandari? Shall we continue for five more minutes? Is it okay with uh, uh, Professor Bandari? Yeah, any more questions? I can look into the chat and see, you know, anything yeah. that I have not tried to cover. Okay. What is the use Yeah, vitamin A, continuous feeds, perforation, caffeine. Maximum dose of caffeine, I, you know, I will use the highest 20 milligrams per kilogram per day if the baby needs it. Uh, but, you know, we start the usual 5 to 10 and, and we go up like that. Um, uh, talked about uh, HFOV steroids. Any reduction in steroids for BPD diagnosis? Uh, we have not analyzed that data, uh, but obviously I use steroids only in the, in the evolving BPD, like I call them, around three to four weeks of life, but that is as for extubation purposes. <laughs> and then we will use um, what is uh, usually commonly called the Bandari regimen, which is actually not me, it's my wife's regimen, where we use prednisolone over seven to 10 days uh, in the baby with established BPD. Uh, and that regimen uh, are the pretty much the only steroid regimen that I would use in, in a baby. Um, uh, Reintubated babies, increase, increase in morbidity in those extubated in the first three days. The answer is no, there is no increase in morbidity. In fact, as I mentioned to you, the BPD is maybe less. Talk about ram candela, we talked about death in BPD, we talked about shock, uh, natal prongs, um, I don't know what he uh, meant by concept of rest in NIV. I do not know what that means. Um, thank you, uh, Livet from Argentina and Hello, Bolivia. Yeah, okay. uh, renting, can we use for, we talked about feeding, I talked about meconium, PIE, uh, tachypnea. If baby is extubated and O2 are okay, but baby has tachypnea, you will go for intubation or wait. This is from Nadal. And the answer is no, I will wait. Uh, if the CO2 and saturation are okay. Uh, I will wait. I will wait uh, if, uh, unless the baby starts having apnea. Again, there are very specific criteria that I use for reintubation. And you see, we talked about NIPPV, PIE, maximum settings. I have told you already. Um, extubation failure, we talked about. IVH, we talked about. Uh, change candela. Change natal candela and natal mask. Uh, you know, like I said, unless the baby is having some breakdown, surrender your, your yeah, thanks. Um, unless there's breakdown, I usually like to stick to the prongs, uh, pictures of how you fix interface, different masks, um, picture will give more. I don't have a picture I can share immediately, but email me, uh, this is from Swetal, and I will try to send you a picture of that from one of my other studies. Okay, and uh, someone pay from Casey Snip. Uh, I mentioned uh, no sedation, please. Uh, recurrent uh, lung collapse, I talk about hourly feeds, that's fine. As long as you give bolus feeds, um, I'm against. Uh, uh, do I have a use for high flow indication for flow? I Like I said, I don't like to use it, but if I have a problem with giving CPAP and I'm a lower oxygen, you might use it. You might want to use it. I definitely don't use uh, flows more than five liters, four liters per minute. Um, paracetamol, while on use paracetamol, um, if Raji said triclofer does not decrease respiratory drive, uh, yeah, if you feel that it, if the data suggests that sedation does not affect the respiratory drive, you can use it. I personally don't have experience with it. I talked about IV caffeine, um, uh, putting baby on PSC mode before health center. Yes, you could try that. Uh, I haven't done that routinely. Like I said, I, I, there's only one or two studies looking at nasal pulse, uh, 
pressure support ventilation. I think Bankalari published one paper. Uh, again, limited experience. Mail ID. Mail ID is bandari beneath at cooperhealth.edu. Again, just put email beneath bandari uh, Cooper Health and you will get it. No problem. Uh, doctor? Dr. Bhandari? Yeah. Dr. Vandari, so um, let me ask. Uh, there, I just just going through uh, respiratory variability index oh, and uh, heart rate variability as markers uh, for uh, extubation success. And there was something about uh, TTI, time tension index, or SVT, spontaneous breathing trials. So how come uh, these things can be used for to assess the success of extubation uh, if from a conventional ventilation, if not from a, an IPV? Yeah, I mean, there are different criteria, you know, there's an um, extubation.net. If you go there, is, you know, trying to predict which babies get extubated. I will tell you one thing that in the first study that I did, I actually did lung function on these babies before I extubated them. So I classified them that if the baby had um, airway resistance higher than a certain number and a lung compliance less than a certain number, I call them bad lungs. And the other ones I call good lungs. And I looked at what happened if I extubate them to NIP or CPAP. What I found is that even with the baby with bad lungs, the one that had less, I mean like high compliance and high resistance, sorry, low lung compliance and high resistance, I had 70% success. Uh, no, yeah, three out of 10, yeah, 70% success with NIPPV and 30% you know, success with, uh, with CPAP. So my suggestion is that I don't really have a good way to predict which babies will succeed on NIPPV as of now. I can tell you, that if the baby is a female, if the baby is weighing more than 750 to 1,000 grams, the baby will do better. That, that much I can tell you, the bigger the baby and, and female, the better the chance of success. Um, but I, at least based on lung function, I was not able to predict. I say, try it out. It's a powerful technique. Use it, try it, maximize it. And uh, I think you will succeed in most of them. Yeah. <laughs> Anything about spontaneous breathing trials? Spontaneous breathing, not recommended. Please do not do that. Uh, if you put a baby um, with a tube and you keep it for five minutes, I'm telling you what I just told you, resistance is increased dramatically. You don't believe me? Take a straw, put it in your mouth and try to breathe through it and you understand what I'm trying to say. I don't use it, not recommended, does not help in predicting which babies will succeed or not succeed. And I don't really have a magical way of predicting which one will succeed, yeah. As we come to the uh, uh, end of the questions, now may I uh, request uh, Dr. Surendra Singh Bish, uh, the Secretary General of NNF India, to propose a word of thanks. Uh, thanks. Uh, it's, a, it's a treat to listen to Dr. Bandari always. Um, and uh, from the experience and the, from the work he has done, uh, it says so much. And I think you must have converted all of us uh, to start an IPPV as our primary mode of respiratory support in all babies. Uh, and uh, certainly for uh, extubation and secondary mode, uh, as of now also we are using uh, NIV. Uh, so we will certainly switch to NIPPV. Now from yes, sometimes we will be yes, always. Uh, I think, Manoj, uh, we owe this to Dr. Bhandari. All of us owe this to Dr. Bhandari. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Bhandari, from, um, from the, on behalf of the uh, whole of NNF. Uh, thanks, Manoj, Gildhar, Murli. And I see so many of our uh, faculties over there. So Mushri is there. And I saw um, international faculties. Dr. Jashi Bonko was there. And everybody was there. And I thanks all of them to join for this uh, Learn with Legions uh, webinar series next, uh, which has uh, brought uh, uh, practical tips. And this was the most practical lecture we had. Uh, you were talking from your heart, your experiences, and that was going straight into the mind and heart of the people. They are going to practice it, sir, certainly. Thank you so Manoj. much. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye now. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Also, thank you both the moderators for moderating the session so well. Thank you, sir. Sir, can we have a brief announcement regarding the next uh, talk and also the certificate, sir? Uh, please, please go ahead. So, the next uh, lecture is scheduled for uh, 20th of April. It's going to be on neonatal seizures. 
current practice and future perspectives by no other than professor ronit pressler from cambridge university uk uh, so uh, please join us the delegates uh, in large numbers for this uh, and spread the message across also and uh, people who want uh, the certificates and also the credit as the link to getting that has been posted in the webinar chat so just copy that link and open it and uh, do the needful it will guide you regarding what needs to be filled up and the payment needs to be done and the certificate will reach you so any anything else sir professor yeah i think a wonderful session uh, a bit uh, prolonged but then uh, i think everybody enjoyed it thank, thank you. you thank you thank you everybody thank you everyone thanks for all the day have a nice time bye until 20th of april recording